And um, for this species and all of them, what is clear are two kind of distinct phases of growth. Um, and in the second phase of growth, there's a significantly slower rate of growth. Um, so what this really points to is uh, the fact that we see this um, maturing stand in the first half, and then in the second half, the response of, of that mature stand. Um, and we would expect that uh, more mature stand to have a closer tie to environmental factors because uh, we wouldn't see as many effects of competition. Um, something else that is uh, notable here for sugar maple is it appears that the second half of the chronology, uh, there's more variability than the first. So more variability in terms of growth year to year, but also um, with these error bars, uh, more variability among sites. So why this is the case, um, we're going to be uh, thinking about, but also looking at statistically. Um, this is American beach growth. Um, and we see, again, those two phases, but uh, less visible variability in the second uh, half of the chronology. And this is yellow birch, um, which, like sugar maple, also appears to be more variable in the second half. Um, and if we think about yellow birch and sugar maple, these are two species that have seen regional decline. Um, that's been attributed at least partially to abiotic factors. Um, so this may be related to why we're seeing this variability. But we didn't see it with American beech, and we don't really see it as much with red maple. So to summarize, um, the growth trends for all four species, we see these two phases. And then for sugar maple and yellow birch, possibly greater variability, which we'll be looking into further. So next I'm going to talk about the climate growth correlations that we looked at. We looked at a suite of climate variables um, and some other variables as well um, to correlate with our growth data. So for uh, using NOAA data, we looked at monthly minimum and maximum temperatures as well as total precipitation. And then two indices of heat, so heating degree days, which is actually a measure of um, cold, and cooling degree days, which is a measure of heat. So just think of the opposite in your mind. Um, we looked at SPEI. Um, standardized precipitation evapotranspiration index, which uh, is a moisture index that may be a better measure of available water to trees because it takes into account things like um, temperature uh, instead of just straight precipitation. And we did this at four time steps. So um, a one month time step is in one particular month, like uh, the moisture index for that month, so for the month of June. And then there's a three month time step that's an aggregate of three months. So if you're a tree in in June in a specific spot, um, SPI 3 is that moisture index for, index for April, May, and June, that aggregate. Also the six and nine month mark. Uh, we also looked at pollution deposition data, um, but in the interest of time, I'm not going to talk about that today. And we correlated these data with a, a ring uh, our ring with index chronology, both for the current year, so the same year's growth, as well as climate data from the previous year, because we know that um, weather that takes place in one year can affect growth in subsequent years. So these are um, correlations between um, moisture and sugar maple growth, and I'm going to spend a minute describing what we're seeing, because uh, I'm going to show a, a bunch of these. So this is... Um, this is the calendar, so this is current year, January to November, and then previous year. So this gray line denotes um, correlations with the previous year's climate data. Um, this is a correlation coefficient uh, on the y-axis. And um, so gray here is SPI1, so the one-month moisture index, and then the aqua is, is the three-month, and the dark blue is the nine-month. We did also have um, significant correlations with precipitation um, and the six month uh, time step, but for the, in order to reduce redundancy, we are just focusing on these for today. And these are significant correlations only. So, what's most evident is that in the, and then there's two halves of the chronology. So, there's this first half up here, 1945 to 1980, and then the bottom um, plot shows 1980 to 2014. So, what's most evident is that. Um, between the first and second half of the chronologies, um, moisture seems to be less important. So we see a lot of positive correlations with moisture in this first half. Um, so why this makes sense, because uh, during this time period, there was a large uh, drought here. 
in the mid-1960s. And so that, uh, that is probably what is showing up here. Um, so in the years where there was less moisture, there was less growth. Um, more moisture, more growth. But we don't really see it here in the second half of the chronology. And this um, makes sense in terms of what we've been hearing a lot um, earlier today, which is that in general precipitation in the Northeast is increasing. So it's likely that um, moisture is really not we're not seeing that as limiting here. What is notable in the second half of the chronology is there's one uh, significant correlation, and that's with previous year's December um, moisture. So if we are assuming that this, that this moisture is in the form of snow, um, then this could uh, point to the importance of that snow at the very beginning of the season. Because um, as we know, snow acts as an insulator for, for fine roots. And there is um, much experimental evidence showing that um, soil freezing is detrimental to, to sugar maple roots. So our observations are in line with that um, experimental evidence. Thinking about temperature, um, there, there is a lot I could talk about. I'm just going to focus on one thing here, really. Um, so in the first half of the chronology, in that same time period, like November, December, uh, the beginning of, end of fall, beginning of winter, we see a, there used to be a positive correlation with minimum temperatures. Um, but what we see over time is that actually shifts. And so now in the second half of the chronology, we see a negative correlation with both minimum, that's in green, and maximum temperatures in November. So because the minimum temperature thing can be kind of confusing, what this means is um, warmer minimum temperature. So when we have uh, the, those coldest nights, as they're get, if they're getting warmer, in those years, growth is reduced. And then when the temperatures are cooler, um, there's a, co a, a correlation with um, more growth there. So this, the fact that this is showing up here, the same, um, this is a similar pattern with, we saw with moisture um, at the, in December, um, this could point to the fact that when there's warmer temperatures, perhaps that means more rain, less snow, and then we don't have that insulation for the rest of the season. This is American beach, um, correlations between moisture and growth, and um, there are multiple positive correlations in both halves of the chrono chronology. What's notable is the shift from correlations with current year climate data to the previous year's climate data. Um, so why exactly the shift is happening, uh, we're not really sure, but it does point to a change uh, occurring in when uh, moisture is important. But what we uh, see here, like we saw with sugar maple, is that is this correlation with one specific month, December, um, and that again might be pointing to the importance of, of snow, perhaps, as in acting as that insulation. Looking at American beach and temperature, in the first half of the chronology, we see negative co a negative correlation with warmer June. So this is maximum temperature in June, and then this is cooling degree days. So remember, that's an index of heat. So we see negative correlations with those, and then a positive correlation with heating degree days, which is a measure of cool. So cooler, ju cooler Junes um, are correlated with greater growth for this species. This is still um, somewhat evident in the second half, but what really uh, is noticeable is what is showing up as new in the second half. So this is um, the month of January, and we see there's a negative correlation with both minimum, that's in green, and maximum temperatures. Um, and so again, this means warmer minimum temperatures um, are correlated with less growth. We also see for Feb, uh, this is February, but it's actually winter minimum and maximum temperatures. So that's for the whole season, December, January, and February. So um, not just in one month, but for the whole season. And this shift to winter minimum temperatures um, particularly is, is interesting um, because if we think about and makes sense because if we think about how temperature has changed over the past century in the Northeast, and we saw these this morning, um, this is um, showing mean temperature in the first column, minimum and maximum temperature. What is clear is that um, in winter, 
minimum temperatures have, um, have increased the most out of any other season and out of the three um, types of temperature listed here. So that could be an explanation for why we're seeing the, those minimum temperatures in the winter showing up as important. Um, for yellow birch, just like uh, we saw for sugar maple, a decrease in importance of moisture variables in general. And for temperature, similar to American beach, um, it, it, previously there were positive correlations with warmer summer temperatures, but that disappears. And what we see is the same thing, a negative correlation with warmer minimum temperatures in the winter. Um, this could be tied to snow, except we didn't see any correlations with um, precipitation in winter like we did with sugar maple. So another explanation um, could have to do with freeze-thaw cycles, which have been shown to um, be detrimental to yellow birch roots um, due to freezing-induced embolism and then poor recovery afterwards. Then our last species, red maple, again, we see a decrease in moisture variables from the, between the first and second half of the chronologies. Um, and very few temperature correlations um, in general, even fewer in the second half. Um, so one reason why this may be is uh, red maple is a generalist species. Um, it can exist in lots of different conditions and shows genotypic variation in different ecosystems. So it exists on dry ridges and swamps and can exist on varying soil textures and pH. So it's possible that mo uh, that climate is just not very limiting to the species um, in this area. So to summarize these uh, climate growth correlations, over time we've seen that moisture has become less important, perhaps pointing to that um, increase in precipitation in the Northeast for sugar maple, yellow birch, and red maple. Um, also that moisture, likely snow, uh, has become more important at the beginning of winter for sugar maple and American beach. And if we think about moving forward projected precipitation um, in this region, uh, the, at the end of the century, if we look at uh, winter, these are for the two emission scenarios, um, lower and higher emission scenarios. So we see that uh, the, there's more, um, a greater increase of precipitation in winter than the other months, um, except whether this is snow or rain will be very important. And then lastly, that um, temperature has become more important in, win in winter for sugar maple, American beech, and yellow birch. So these changes in winter temperatures um, for these species, which are you know, really adapted to this ecosystem, um, seem to be uh, showing up as having, uh, are showing more correlations than with red maple, which is less adapted you know, specifically to this ecosystem. That's everything I have for today, and I, I'd be happy to take any questions. That's, I think, uh, maybe it wasn't clear, but I was trying to say, yeah, it was showing the, a mature forest. So that is, yeah, what those, what those are showing, that our forests have matured. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great um, have you looked at any side effects of location or elevation and variability in response across the state, or do you expect it to change across the region? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, the question was, have, you, I looked at, have we looked at variation uh, in, in terms of um, like across the state, elevation, and, or some other latitude, things like that? Um, that is the plan. Yeah, we're going to divide these up certainly by uh, the sites on the site level, by age, size, elevation. Um, those are the ones we were planning on looking to see, yeah. And also that might point to some of that variability to get a sense of like, okay, are certain sites more variable than others? And if so, is that attributable to some of those characteristics? Yeah. Okay, yeah. One more question if anyone has. Yeah. Uh, I think I might be asking the same question that I'll make that's really different. Um, so what do we know about forest uh, in the 1930s, it's possible that there was like this massive clearing and the increased growth rates of the reserve due to the trees just growing really fast in the fields. I 
Um, so yeah, of course there were disturbances. I think in terms of like massive disturbances, um, I know there was. I think there. I'm sure there were. There have been like events, but nothing like massive across the landscape. We also like selected for. Um, uh, we chose sites that we that from as far as we could tell, like you know, there wasn't. Uh, any management. I guess you're talking more about disturbance though than management and a cutoff. Yeah, um, but I don't think there's anything like massive like that 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 happened across the state. I think there were like events certainly throughout that first half of the chronology, but um, yeah. Great, thank you.